We're live. Four, three, two, one. Uh, okay, so welcome everybody to our next uh, session uh, on Virtually Shackleton. Uh, it's uh, called Trick and or Treaty. It's about the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, Antarctic Treaty is a topic that has been hotly and coldly debated um, in the autumn school uh, over the past 20 years. And we are very fortunate today to be joined by um, our government minister, Minister Malcolm Noonan, and Bob Headland, who, who you'll be familiar with, Bob, um, archivist in the Scott Polar Research Institute. Uh, they're going to discuss the Antarctic Treaty. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. If, if I might say this, and uh, Minister, this is something with uh, a thigh we've had for quite a while. There's been an open forum and quite an amount of discussion on the treaty. So, in a sense, from the Shackleton Autumn School, we're continuing a little bit, uh, if you agree. <laughs> Yes, I agree. And it's a great, first of all, it's a great privilege to be here uh, to, to address you all virtually at the, the Shackleton um, Autumn School. And it's interesting, I had a really lengthy conversation. I, Bob and I spoke as well a number of days ago, but I also spoke last night with Mike Walker, who just uh, came off a 10 hour session of the 26 CC uh, AMLR, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic uh, Marine and Living Resources a a Treaty Group. And again, a disappointing outcome from that. But um, he he was pointing out to me a number of things of, of interest and that 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 deep Irish connection with Antarctica from uh, Edward Bransfield's uh, discovery in inverted commas uh, a few days after a Russian vessel had come across it uh, back in and Edver, Edward is from Ballincorra in County Cork um, and has had uh, the Bransfield Strait Bransfield Mountain named after him uh, right through I think Bob you were mentioning uh, seventy odd names that have Irish connections in Antarctica so. Uh, right up to the that the, the golden age and and the the the, the era of of Shackleton, I think we have a very very strong connection with Antarctica, and I think in that regard, it's important and timely that we have these discussions. From my perspective as Heritage Minister, I feel we should be um, progressing with with uh, signing to the to the treaty. Uh, I think it's 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 something I would like to bring forward over the next number of months and years. I uh, very, very, very pleased to hear that. Actually, Malcolm, uh, the circumstances: Antarctica is bigger than Europe, over ninety-nine percent covered by ice, so remote. Edward Bransfield first first sighting it, eighteen twenty, two centuries ago, and uh, the Irish connection with James Clark Ross, the number of people with the heroic age, Shackleton, the best, but by no means the only one. And uh, thanks for ma- mentioning the place names. In Nimrod, the Journal of Athai, uh, so far we've got um, 76 um, details of all of them, but uh, that's a challenge. It's rather hard to find you. That's going to be a list that goes on for a while. But the uh, ancient and the modern and the conservation and wise use of resources all very much involving the treaty. Yeah, very much so. And I think, uh, you know, given, given that we're in, in the depths of a, a climate and biodiversity crisis, as recognised by the Irish Parliament uh, last year, I, I think that it's, it's, it's quite timely that we have these conversations. COVID has dominated and continues to dominate the, the headlines globally, but the, the climate and biodiversity crisis won't go away and they, they will still be with us. And, for, and with that regard, I think the, our international obligations um, towards uh, the, the, the future of our, our collective future I think is vitally important and in keeping with the sustainable development goals for which uh, Ireland has underpinned its current program for government. So I, I think there's a, a good convergence and, and a meeting of, of, uh, of a lot of uh, policies that should be directing us towards um, uh, stepping up internationally. A good thing from the Antarctic point of view. So far, it's the only continent without COVID, and there's a lot of effort being uh, being done to maintain that one. But uh, the continent for science, the international cooperation, what's occurred there, there, there were territorial divisions. Indeed, they're far from uh, dead, but uh, they're effectively neutralized with this now. The international side, the treaty has uh, 54 members. If you uh, tot up the populations, bear, bear in mind India, China, and Brazil are there, that represents 80% of the population of the Earth. Uh, at least last time I, I, I didn't check the count. And um, putting dates, the uh, treaty will be uh, 60 on the 23rd of June uh, next year. And I see 
the Irish connection is a very timely one. It, it is certainly is, and you know, it's funny. It's funny. I was reading um, through um, through. Uh, uh, I, I suppose I, I picked out um, uh, Michael Smith's book again last night uh, and reading through it, and and that that there was a, a lovely piece of banter that Frank Warsey re, re, recalls of uh, of um, Queen and of Tom Queen and Shackleton uh, in the in the James Caird as they were sailing to South Georgia. And uh, that that really is only so so Irish and puts that whole Irish stamp on it. About where where um, Shackleton says to Queen, "Go to sleep, Queen, and don't be clucking like an old hen, boss. I can't eat those old reindeer hairs. I'd have an inside on inside on me like a billy goat's neck." And you know, it's it's I, I love uh, the fact that that's part of of international uh, history of 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 Antarctica, and s speak something very specifically that that really only the Irish in 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 times of great adversity when there's hopelessness there that they can bring forward and have a, a sense of humor and still a sense of of um of of hope and i think that's something that we should be bringing forward as a nation and um, that that spirit uh, that spirit of adventure but also that spirit of that there is always hope e even in times of great despair i very much like the uh, tom Crean connection because uh, as you know uh, his pub the south pole inn is alive and well in county kerry and his antarctic biography with two uh, winters aboard uh, discovery that was a success it did very well uh, excellent mapping and so forth then he was with uh, captain scott on terra nova that was a tragedy with five men frozen to death although the exploration was amazing and then uh, the uh, winter aboard Endurance and the crossing of South Georgia with Shackleton. With the loss of the ship, that was a disaster, but they all got out. And success, tragedy, disaster, some of the best sledging distances going. You could understand, back to his home village, bought a pub and uh, settled there very nicely and still going. Yeah, and it's amazing, even speaking to Mike last night, he was saying how... how in talking to his international co colleagues uh, in in the coalition, um, they still uh, herald Green and Shackleton as among their favourites of the of the polar explorers. So you know, I think that's it's really important to to acknowledge that as well. And um, you know, I, I think too that uh, you know, from our, our our perspective, that we should be taking our place in this uh, global ocean alliance. I know my my own colleague Grace O'Sullivan, who who's uh, has a, an incredible history uh, in. In, in maritime protection and in in ocean protection, um, w wants us to go the distance and, and go for that 3030 alliance, which is the 30 percent protection protection by 2030. And I really believe that we should be doing that. This is a very nice example where with the uh, Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, that's a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> only a short while ago. Uh, but the the 1800s, with all the islands, the fur seals and elephant seals, the Southern Ocean was a period of massive and uncontrolled exploitation. There were a few words about it, but uh, it didn't count. The whaling in the Arctic, the polar regions both get into it. Uh, that started in the Antarctic in 1904, so much on South Georgia, which Shackleton called the gateway to the Antarctic. That there were attempts at regulation, but it didn't really get anywhere. It's the second period of, I think we can safely say, over exploitation. Now, fortunately, good science on this, and some of the seal men have been, uh, well, Fergus O'Gorman in Dublin and uh, uh, Seamus McCann, who was speaking in a thigh, working on the seals. That's recovered, and now the resources are krill, fish, and squid, and it is scientific research, investigation and fairly effective control at a very large area. The marine resources are an example. Two bad periods and now a good one with, with science. Yeah, I, that's really encouraging to hear and, and, and encouraging too to hear Urs Ursula von der Leyen speaking in her State of the Union address to the, to the European uh, Parliament that uh, she wanted to see greater protection and that she wanted to address explicitly in her commitment to invest more in environmental causes with the European Union, and in particular, and including, she mentioned in her in her address, the Southern Ocean. So I, I think what you know, in, in speaking just uh, a few minutes ago, just about that convergence and that perhaps the the meeting of the waters, there is a, a there seems to be a, a willingness at, a, at an ar overarching policy level, uh, right down to uh, practical actions uh, to to see greater protection. So, uh, in that regard, I'm. Um, 
I'm somewhat disappointed that the, that perhaps uh, that Ireland is not responding in kind. And um, I think in particular, I look back at, at a couple of debates in, in the, first of all, a parliamentary question that was put in 2003 by uh, then Senator Shane Ross um, asking the Minister of State about, around the Antarctic Treaty. And uh, the response uh, from from the minister at the time wasn't, was that uh, while he said Ireland was sympathetic to the view that the Antarctic should be seen as part of the common heritage uh, shared universally, he stated that the Madrid Protocol was functioning effectively and stated that Ireland would at the time uh, not be acceding to the treaty in the period immediately ahead, which again was disappointing. And more recently, um, our, our current Minister for Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney, said that uh, in, in response to a, a parliamentary question, uh, he said that while the objectives and achievements of the Antarctic tr treaty system are of considerable importance and the commitments of the signatories is commendable, research to date has found that direct benefits to Ireland of ratification would be relatively minor. I, I you know, I'm, I have to say I'm, I would disagree with that contention because the, the benefits to Ireland are the benefits to us all globally, given the significant challenges we face with climate change and biodiversity loss. Therefore, I, I would be of the view that we really should give serious consideration to it, given that, you know, within my own department now, we are looking at uh, expanding marine protected areas in this country. And I think uh, both Ireland and Portugal would, would have the greatest marine resources within the union. We should also be giving consideration to acceding to the, the Antarctic Treaty. I think it's a it's 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 timely. And given all these um, anniversaries that you're speaking about, that, uh, I think it's timely that we would do it sooner rather than later. Well, thanks. It's very good to hear that. I remember when Senator Ross was uh, addressing Earth Eye, he was very keen on things like this. Uh, and he was right. Certainly the Madrid Protocol, the questions of uh, Camelar and so forth, are all there and very much involved. But there's a bit uh, from the Madrid Protocol with the questions of uh, minerals and things like this. It had a moratorium for 50 years. It's done a lot for it. But a section of it, if I, if I might go on to read the uh, protocol from the Antarctic Treaty Handbook, the protocol shall supplement the Antarctic Treaty and shall neither modify nor amend the treaty. The treaty is basic to all this. Okay, that's interesting. That's really interesting. And do you think then that, that um, you know, g given those those responses, that, that perhaps um, there there is... Uh, I suppose some back channeling that we, that could be done in terms of encouraging the Irish government to move forward in a in a much more uh, positive and proactive way. I think one of the important things the international side is significant. There's comparisons, for instance, Iceland joined only a few years ago and sorted many of the problems out there. The Norwegian uh, delegation has been substantial in this, and there's, there's good advice and comments there. But one of the practical things is that. Uh, in a sense, some of the names I mentioned, and more recently, Mike Jessup from uh, Cork has been working in the Antarctic. Ireland, to some extent, already has a very cost-effective Antarctic program because scientists are working with Australia, Britain, New Zealand, United States, and so forth. So the science isn't necessarily an expense. The political side of things, the joining and the signatory, as as a member rather than a consultative party, which requires coordinated research, then let's face it, thinking of the basics of government, time and finance are not severe commitments. Uh, starting a research program, such as many countries have in an organized institute is another one, but that is not necessary to be involved. Uh, and indeed, with the cases I've mentioned through various other countries, Irish research in the Antarctic is already doing well. And, and that's really interesting to hear because you've, if you think of the the legacy of of, of Tyndall, who was of of my parish here in the, in, in Carlow Kilkenny, and and the the um, already uh, really well uh, resourced uh, climate sci science um, research that goes on in this country, we surely have a lot to to not just to learn but to gain, but also to share with the international community, uh, given um, the great respect there is there for for uh, Irish research. Uh, I'd, uh, I thoroughly agree with you there from the Irish point of view. From another point of view, I think it would be a benefit to the treaty also. I think so too. I, the the, um, the comments of uh, Andrea Kavanagh, Director of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean uh, work at, at Pew Charitable Trust, said that the overall failure 
of the global le leadership to protect this critical ecosystem is deeply concerning. And she said that on the 200th anniversary of the discovery of Antarctica and the eve of the 60th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty going into force, the establishment of new marine protected areas of the Southern Ocean should have been an easy decision. And yet, uh, I mean, you know, from talking to Mike again, um, the it would seem that some countries um, uh, would, would be uh, appear to be blocking or, or not not supportive at all. Uh, and do you think that's it's the larger countries that perhaps the, the China and Russia come to mind that their um, lack of, of full support for this is a, is a real challenge? I think most of this with the expansion of the fishing industry then the far east in particular china is involved with this but they are members of the uh, convention on the conservation commission so uh i i'd hesitate to see so much on chinese politics but with much of europe i think the, the uh, support would be all around and places where there have been conflict and difficulty uh, perhaps the worst case of this is what in polite company we call the abc problem that's Argentina, Britain, and Chile. We won't get into that one. But with matters with the Antarctic Treaty and the fishing regulation in the Southern Ocean, even that, uh, the ABC mixture, gets on well, effectively, for the good of all of them. Fish are no respecters of international law. Absolutely. And uh, just another question, given that we're also on the cusp of, uh, of a the, the um, US presidential elections and given the intervention of Obama and, and Kerry in 2016 on the, the, the Ross Sea uh, Marine Protected Area, which is the largest in the world, um, do you think that a, a change in administration in, in the United States might be a, a welcome addition to, to, to securing these international agreements and expanding these marine protected areas? I think the president incumbent is very national and for the United States. I think a broader international outlook is good for the US and frankly, everybody else. I think so too. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, again, I just, um, I'm, I'm really curious because I, I think it's something from my own perspective as a, a fairly newly um, appointed minister in, in, in Irish government. And I'm just so, um, encouraged by the uh by the work of 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 the of the of the shackleton committee in in a thigh 20 years now having done such amazing work and i think uh, do you think that that the, the the international recognition for for shackleton's legacy that has stemmed from a thigh has had um is 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 given the due recognition that i think it deserves I, because i'm really impressed by by the work that they've done Oh, I thoroughly agree with you. Athai has done extremely well here. Uh, if we go through the years, I think of the, well, we'll include the Antarctic, no problem. Every continent's been represented and people have come from far and wide. I, uh, a, a colleague of uh, mine from New Zealand has been a, a regular person turning up. And uh, you, you name it, there's not many countries with an Antarctic involvement who haven't uh, been around. The Things like Nimrod and the publications have circulated widely, and uh, it's a very good established feature now. Twenty years. It, it's wonderful and, and and just an amazing achievement. And and uh, fr from what what are your hopes? Do you think that that um, you know again, given the, the the huge challenges we face in in terms of climate and biodiversity loss? What are your hopes into the next? Uh, given that uh, next year is a really significant year. For biodiversity in particular, that um, that we can make um, international, uh, you know, big international gains on climate and biodiversity. There's a lot to say on this one. I was first in the Antarctic uh, a couple of years ago in 1977, and the way the ice has retreated, glaciers gone back, and all sorts of things. The measurement and the science and research of this gets the whole concept of climatic change much more refined and much more data and that's becoming more serious the biological side of things anything of this nature is dependent on the climates and the basic of basic aspects of the earth arctic and antarctic are two places where it can be measured far more accurately and reasonably with so so small human population the human effects are comparatively minor there so the research side to understand and predict as far as possible uh, that's significant the changes over the 
decades and centuries how that's measured. You've got fundamental data, and uh, there's certainly plenty of warnings how one can estimate and research on what that will yield. I wonder about the changes in the Earth in general, the aspects of the human control things, for instance, the over-exploitation of marine in particular resources is one thing we can do. Nature's another one. One can improve the understanding, but the remedy, much of that's in our hands too. It very much is. And um, I'm looking at our own. We have a fantastic report just uh, that I just received last week in relation to marine protected areas. And it's, uh, it's encouraging to see um, reference to uh, international agreements as well and treaty. And I think that um, yet there's not a, a greater public awareness of the importance of marine protected areas. And do you think that's a, a significant challenge? I uh, thoroughly agreed. Uh, and things like events now and Ireland and the treaty is uh, very much involved in this. Okay, great. Okay, maybe I can come in with a few questions if, if that's okay with everybody. Yes, indeed. Um, we have a question from Richard, Richard Webb, and uh, his question is, should we not at least have an Irish Institute of Polar Studies? Bob, do you want to take that first? Uh, well, informally, there's uh, quite a substantial number of uh, people from Ireland who have been working in Polar Studies Institutes elsewhere. But with an academic institute, yes, for polar, but certain aspects of the um, biological resources, all this sort of thing, perhaps the institute could do something similar, but be a bit more widespread. Not just the poles, but these problems concern the oceans and so forth. So... Uh, Look a bit broader than narrower, but the poles will be involved. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that contention, and I think you know we all already have um, within National University of Ireland and Maynooth uh, that you know the the, the um, climate unit there. So I think there's perhaps even to you know included in that. I think might be a way forward. Sure. I'm sure it is. Okay. But uh, okay, okay. Question from Sheena now, and it's about. Uh, that fantastic topic. I, I'm sh sure you'll be comfortable talking about this, Minister. It's about Brexit. And yes. maybe, um, Bob and the Minister, currently um, a lot of our connections through to the Antarctic would route through uh, United Kingdom. And has, you know, any ideas what impact would Brexit have on, um, you know, educational science research type linkages? First, <laughs> I, I, suppose, I mean, in, I, I think it's. I think Brexit's going to have uh, huge and far-reaching implications uh, right across every sphere. But I don't doubt that uh, the academic community, uh, regardless of borders, will continue to collaborate and work together. And I think that you know that's proven itself. I think we're already looking at um, you know an all-island uh, biodiversity you know, uh, research and, and uh, you know, to disre disregarding the border, because uh, I think Bob mentioned quite well there that, that, that you know, these, these issues know no, no boundaries. Therefore, and, and, it, and I, I'm encouraged by the commitment of Ursula von der Leyen in relation to our international agreements. And uh, I think over time, I think uh, these things will heal themselves. And I, I think the, the urge of, of, of us collectively to want to share research uh, for benign purposes mm -hmm. Will always be there regardless of of, of, um, of boundaries. Mm -hmm. Thoroughly agree. Uh, the research of British Antarctic Survey, which has very little directly to do with uh, Britain and the European Union, although we the survey collaborates with many organisations in the Union and elsewhere. And for instance, Scott Polar, the library, the, these will continue. So the access will uh, be basically unchanged. There are quite a number of scientists who are lamenting the question of uh, separating government from money for scientific research, and the EU has quite a lot to do with that. So that's another subject. But uh, okay. the cooperation, no, that won't change. Okay, okay, we've, we've another question from Val Kerr. Um, and Val's question is, can marine protected areas survive if vast areas of the oceans are unprotected and exploited? I mean, do fish know anything about borders? Uh, fish are no respecters of international law, but with the Southern Ocean, then there are naval patrols, fishing patrols, quite a lot of detection of the illegal, unmonitored, unregulated fishing industry. 
and in many cases uh, this has been subject to legal procedures, the amount of take of fish, squid and krill, Camelot does regulate this under scientific management. So that's probably one of the best of all the oceans and an example for elsewhere. But uh, okay. as you say, fish are no respecters of international law. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah, and again, uh, as I said, we're looking at our marine protected areas uh, in this in this uh, really wonderful report. I still think they're they're vitally important, and we're looking at a lot of different, uh, you know, not just you know heritage marine protected areas, cultural marine protected areas. There's a lot of different uh, types of them that really will be important to um, coastal communities uh, into the future. So I, I think they have um, a standalone importance, but we can't disregard. Um, what's happening out in the in the high in the high seas? There's no doubt about that. And that's where we have okay. problems with the flag of convenience. Certain uh, countries in the Horn of Africa and Central America, um, their their flag has a certain degree of notoriety, if I can put it politely. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, a comment. I, I'm not sure. Is it a question or a comment from Amanda? Um, and it's about really the um, th being part of the Antarctic Treaty even if Ireland uh, might have questions to be resolved about uh, claims and uh, territorial claims prior to 1959 and so on. But surely being part of the treaty is a stronger position than being outside it. Un unquestionably. I, I, it's, it's, I agree. I'm absolutely right. We, we wholeheartedly agree. And uh, again, you know, I wouldn't agree with the contention that the, the benefits to Ireland are, are, are limited. I think they're in quite, quite unlimited. I think we have huge amount to gain uh, for, by, by being involved. Okay, okay. Just a few more questions if we can get through them. Uh, we, we still have a, a few minutes. Um, and maybe I'll come back to you at the end of these for a sort of a wrap-up comment, okay? Um, question from Joe, uh, and I think that's probably Joe O'Farrell, who's, who's one of our committee here. Um, does the minister believe there's any chance Ireland will sign the treaty by 2022, the centenary of Shackleton's death? A, a good question, and, and my pol political answer will be: I'm, I'm glad you asked me that, Joe. I, I will certainly, <laughs> from, <laughs> from from yeah. from my perspective, um, I, I think it's important as as minister with responsibility for natural heritage in this in this uh, jurisdiction that we would. I, I would certainly be making a very strong case that we do. And I okay. encourage my colleagues in government that we do. Uh, it's not okay. uh, specifically itemised in the pro in the program for government, but I do think it's something we should. Yeah. It, it would do us th the world of good to be to be uh, uh, to be there for twenty twenty two. Yes. Okay. okay, and I suppose obviously, Minister, we, you know, you you kindly joined us here. We don't expect any. Um, you know, we know politics is a, is the art of the black arts and the negotiation and whatever else. So, you know, we, we're this has been a really good discussion, and um, I suppose questions like that are sort of thoughts of what people would like. You know, um, absolutely. Yeah. And question then maybe for for both, and and maybe Bob, you could take it first. Um, are there other agreements similar to the Antarctic Treaty with which Ireland is involved? Uh, that, that's an interesting one. By the way, just going back to uh, what Malcolm was saying a few moments ago, this is effectively an extension of the open forum of uh, a thigh, isn't it? But uh, it is. thinking of polar regions, in 1920 there was the Spitsbergen Treaty, uh, of which Ireland's a member, which guaranteed, uh, it solved the problems of disputed sovereignty, of resources, exploitation and that sort of thing, for Spitsbergen and Svalbard. Now, that treaty is a lot of similarities to the problems, although the solutions were different, uh, to the Antarctic Treaty. And that's a well-established one of Ireland and a polar region. Uh, it's had its problems. There was the demilitarization, but then the uh, Second World War rather mucked that up. But it's been sorted. It recovered, going fairly well now. And countries that disagree on a number of items at the moment, Norway, the country with sovereignty, and Russia haven't always agreed on, for instance, fishing limits, among other matters, but the solution and the frontiers have been sorted out diplomatically, and that has okay. one century of history behind it. Okay. And is there an issue there, Bob, in relation to the Spitsbergen Treaty, given that uh, Ireland was a, a signatory um, while we were still a part of... of, of uh, of um, 
that we it was before the Irish Free State, and yes. and so is that is that still a challenge or is it still? Uh, I don't think that's a challenge because quite a number of other countries that are signatories and have acted under the Spitsbergen Treaty have all come under the same uh, 1920 umbrella quite a long time ago. Okay. 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 So I'm going to we've we've run out of time. Um, I won't get a chance to get a summary from you, but um, this has been a really interesting session. You can see by the, the amount of questions and the level of interest uh, that's happening online, there's a lot of people interested in this. So I would like to thank, on behalf of Virtually Shackled in 2020, I'd like to thank Minister Malcolm Noonan for joining us uh, for this conversation and for Bob for so ably um, cheering it, for carrying on our open forums for years when, when the questions were coming and just for his general support no for everything. Brian. Thank you. Thanks. Oh yeah, so next up uh, at a quarter past three, um, we have Bob Burton, who's going to tell us whether bringing ponies to Antarctica was the right or the wrong decision. See you then. Hello, hi, just want to say hello to our friends in Athai, the usual faces that we see. Uh, I'll be missing you this year. Uh, I had a great catch up this week on Zoom with my polar pals Maureen and Margaret and Anne and Evelyn, so I'd like to say hello to them. And uh, we all met in 2012. Our keen interest in all things Antarctic brought us together. Um, and we like to stay in touch. And um, I'm missing them this year. Um, so have a great time, everyone. Um, tune in on Saturday. Bye. Hello, I'm Nick Philpott. I come from Formby near Liverpool. I had a long uh, interest in polar history and I was fortunate enough to go to the Antarctic about 11 years ago with my brother-in-law, uh, Patrick Armstrong, whom some of you'll know. And I'm very much looking forward to the virtually Shackleton Day. Bye for now. <laughs>